And Jesus answered them, saying, The hour is come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Verily, verily, I say to you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abides alone. But if it dies, it brings forth much fruit. He that loves his life shall lose it, and he that hates his life in this world shall keep it unto life eternal. If any man serve me, let him follow me, and where I am, there shall also my servant be. If any man serve me, him will my father honour. Well, it's a much more minor honour, but nevertheless it is an honour and a great responsibility to be asked to bring God's word to you here in Melbourne Hall this morning on this Remembrance Sunday. Maybe some of you may think it's a bit strange to have a layman wearing a military uniform in the pulpit, but I hope you'll understand that I speak on this day both as a representative of those who've served their country in times of conflict, but also as a Christian for whom the word of God is a living and active sword that has to be wielded with very great care. And I don't know whether I'm up to it, but I think we should pray, don't you? Let's pray together as we come to God's word. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your indwelling spirit. We pray, Lord, that you would pour out your spirit amongst us this morning, that we may have eyes that are unstopped, that we may have ears that are unstopped, eyes that may see the wonderful things that are in your word. We pray, Lord, that you would prepare our hearts to receive it and that you would do a great work amongst us. Lord, move us by your spirit. Soften our hard hearts. Give us hearts of flesh rather than hearts of stone. We pray, Lord, that you would bless your word amongst us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I suppose if we're honest, uh, we're all a bit curious about prominent people in society or so-called celebrity people. Um, there's a celebrity culture out there, isn't it? And some of us may even be a bit tempted to name drop from time to time. Maybe if you've met or talked with a famous person or if you went to school with someone who's now a household name. Um, perhaps like my wife, you bumped into a famous person in Waitrose and exchanged a few words. Or you've been privileged maybe to meet Her Majesty the Queen. Uh, or maybe your work has taken you into the company of famous politicians or professors and you've been able to ask them a few questions. And you're quite happy to tell others about that at the odd dinner party. In the passage we read earlier from John's Gospel, Jesus has just entered Jerusalem in fulfilment of the prophecy as a king riding on a colt, the foal of a donkey. And as he entered the city, you might remember, the people shouted, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They threw down palm branches as the excitement built and they hailed Jesus as the coming king. Word too about the raising of Lazarus from the dead was was spreading like wildfire in the city, so that it seemed to the Pharisees, as we read together, that the whole world had gone after him. See that in verse 19. And it's just after this event, with excitement and expectation running high, that some Greek worshippers at the Jewish festival approach Philip the disciple. Now, Philip may have had some Greek connections. His name is a Greek name. And they come and they say, sir, we would see Jesus. <laughs> it's, it's a lovely, isn't it, and famous quote 
um, many of you are probably familiar with it. Uh, I've heard, I don't think it's true here, but I've heard that some church pulpits even have the words engraved in plain sight for the preacher just to remind the preacher to point people to Jesus. Quite a lovely idea, isn't it? But here, of course, these Greek worshippers are asking for an exclusive audience with Jesus. Now, why are they doing that? Well, because the whole city is talking about Jesus. It's said that he's raised the dead. He's just entered the city as king, coming in peace, riding on a colt, the foal of a donkey, and in the name of the Lord. So they're intrigued. They want to ask questions. Is he the promised Messiah? Has he come as king? Is this the beginning of a revolution? Of course, we're not told exactly what they wanted to ask or why, but Jesus knows their thoughts and he answers with what must have seemed to them like a kind of riddle except a corn or wheat seed fall into the crown and, and die it abides alone but if it die it brings forth much fruit Jesus wants these Greek worshippers to know that if they want to see him they will be seeing in effect a condemned man. A man not about to be a Jewish hero or a freedom fighter or an earthly king, but a man on the road to suffering, humiliation and death on a Roman cross. We're not exactly told how the Greek worshippers reacted, but it's clear from verse 34 that the crowd did not understand his words at all. And probably our Greek worshippers were equally puzzled and confused by the answer that they received. So why these words before us this morning on a Remembrance Sunday? Because I think these words of Jesus pointing to his death resonate closely with us as we think of those men and women who sacrificed their lives to defend their country and protect our freedoms. And perhaps in what we often describe as the ultimate sacrifice, even when given amidst the sinful horror of human conflict, there is that faint reflection of the greatest sacrifice of all, when Jesus sends his only begotten Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, to die on a cross to redeem his people. You know, we don't in any way seek to glorify war on Remembrance Sunday. In his New Testament letter, James writes, From whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence, even of your lusts that war in your members? You lust and have not. You kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. You fight and war, yet you have not because you ask not. You ask and receive not because you ask amiss that you may consume it upon your lusts. And that, my friends, was written to a church. Perhaps nothing so starkly reveals the glory and the garbage of human nature than the terrible realities of war. It reveals a depth of depravity and evil present in humanity which is shocking, even to us. But it also produces accounts of great courage Discipline, selfless commitment, faithfulness, loyalty and love. Those human traits that seem to transcend natural explanation and be a, an imprint or a pale reflection of our creator in whose image we are made. So with the usual mix of emotions, we remember and honour those who gave their lives in two world wars and subsequent conflicts to protect their loved ones, to serve their country, 
and to win the democratic freedoms that we hold so dear. A while back I saw on the TV a, a group of school children on a battlefield visit in France being interviewed as they stood near the grave of a young soldier aged only 15, expressing their horror at, that someone their own age, so young, sacrificing so much. One of them read a poem of Wilfred Owen, who died in the last week of that great war. Perhaps we wonder at the waste of life, the futility of war, the apparent pointlessness of it all. But in our passage today, Jesus predicts his own death by reminding us that it's necessary for a seed to fall to the earth and die in order for new life to begin and a harvest to be produced. See, when the sacrifice is so great, we should be humbled by those who made it. And surely we should value all the more our peaceful democracy, our human rights and the freedoms we so easily take for granted because they were bought at a great price. But perhaps we need to remember that sacrificial love is at the heart of the Christian message too. Only the wonder is that it comes from Almighty God himself. Perhaps at this time of year when we remember the fallen, our cynical, godless society could pause and ask the question again. What if there is a God who is not silent, a God who sacrificed himself out of love for a broken and damaged world, full of humans made in his image but marred and corrupted by evil? What if this sacrifice, motivated by love, is the only way that evil can be overcome, justice done, death defeated, hope restored? The thought is shocking, confusing, unexpected perhaps for those who have all sorts of uninformed preconceptions about God. You see, this is no, no distant deity, no pantheistic mystery. This is no unnamed cosmic force like something out of Star Wars. This is a personal infinite, eternal, unchangeable God with such great love for the world that he has created that he enters it, becomes a man in the person of Jesus Christ in order to redeem, to buy back what he already owns by sacrificing his own life. This is extraordinary, isn't it? So here in this remarkable passage, where Jesus predicts his death in response to those curious Greeks, we have, I think, three key elements for you to take away. So for, th for those of you who like some memory joggers to discuss over lunch, you might think of them here as seekers, seeds, and servants. Well, that do you? Seekers, seeds and servants. First of all then, and very briefly, seekers. You'll see that in verses 20 to 22. Among the crowd of Jews at the festival, there are some who come seeking Jesus. Some Greek worshippers. Most probably they were what we call proselytes or God-fearing Greeks who'd come to the Passover feast and they would have been allowed to worship in the temple courts, the court of the Gentiles. And they are clearly intrigued about everything they've heard of Jesus. But being Greeks, perhaps they hesitate to approach him directly. And so they approach Philip, perhaps because he had a Greek name. And they approach very politely, sir, they say we would see Jesus. Clearly, they don't just want to see Jesus, they want to talk to Jesus, to speak with him, perhaps to ask questions of him. And on the face of it, this is a wonderful request. We don't know their real motives. 
but they must have known that it was an unusual request and approach. And certainly they were eager and persistent in wanting to have a personal encounter with Jesus, this one who is said to have raised the dead, to have healed the sick, to have ridden into the city as a coming king. It seems, you see, that they were already worshippers of the God of Israel. They'd rejected the fanciful gods of the Greeks, of mythology, along with Greek philosophy and wisdom, to worship one God and to seek the truth. It seems, or it seems to me at least, that they were concerned about salvation and they wanted to know more. Perhaps you can identify with those men this morning. Maybe you're done with the fake gods of the 21st century that promise so much and deliver so little. Maybe you can see the emptiness and futility of worldly and godly philo godly, godless philosophies. And you're intrigued by the person of Jesus Christ and you want to know more. As a seeker after truth, perhaps you've come here this morning hoping to meet the one who can satisfy your deepest needs, fill the empty longings of your heart, take away that burden of sin and guilt that weighs you down and which you've tried to drown out with the distractions of this world. Maybe you're just curious about Jesus, the one whose birth is strangely celebrated at Christmas, whose death is celebrated by a cross that so many people wear, and whose life is marked even by the dates of our calendar. If so, take heart, because there are great promises in Scripture for those who genuinely seek after the truth, and the truth that is found in Jesus. In Matthew's Gospel, Jesus is recorded as saying, ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. And this, of course, echoes so many great encouragements from the Old Testament prophets, like Isaiah, who encourages us to seek the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. A verse that was very special to me personally is found in Jeremiah 29, 31. You shall seek me and find me when you shall search for me with all your heart. You know, I came to a point as a young man, I was brought up in a Christian family, went to church, and uh, I think I never really got it. I tried time and time again to turn over a new leaf without success. Tried to be a better person, failed miserably. Then I was confronted by this verse and I realised that my seeking after God such as it was, was half-hearted. and That God wanted my whole heart. Seeking him had to become the most important thing in my life. When I realised that, I think then it was that I was found by him. These Greek worshippers came seeking Jesus for themselves. Sir, they said, we would see Jesus. Maybe that could be your heartfelt prayer this morning. Secondly, seeds, remember? Seekers, seeds. Because Jesus answers their requests unexpectedly and confusingly. To the ears of the inquirers and onlookers, it must have seemed like a riddle or maybe some sort of memorable saying. The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Jesus refers to himself as the Son of Man. Do you notice that? Which on the face of it simply speaks of his humanity. But many of his hearers would have known that it was a reference to Daniel 7 and the exalted figure of the Son of Man who is depicted there. It's a subtle reference, you see, to both his humanity and his divinity for those whose ears were tuned to hear it. But then he goes on to say, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, 
It remains only a single seed, but if it dies, it produces many seeds. And so he's foretelling his own death, which is soon to come. In a way, I think of it as a sort of eve of battle speech. Have you heard of those? The Greeks come to Jesus as outsiders wanting to meet and talk. But Jesus knows that his hour has come. Time is short and there's no turning back. There's no other option. Love compels him to die. He must act now to save his people and defeat the powers of darkness. Like soldiers who know the realities and horrors of battle, Jesus knows what lies ahead. And we read that his soul was troubled. Should he ask to be saved from the ordeal? No. It's for this reason he has come. The purpose for which he has entered the world. Verse 27. And that purpose, that mission, it was to redeem, restore and renew a broken and sinful world. You see, this morning we've taken time to remember those who paid the ultimate price in situations of human conflict. But sadly, as we read our news feeds or watch our screens, we continue to see deep divisions, injustice, bloodshed, poverty, injustice, exploitation, cruelty, inequality, prejudice, mostly caused by greed and lust and pride on the part of men and women like you and me. So that the whole world is broken and humanity is alienated from God in whose image we have been made. For the crowd, Jesus' words were shocking and confusing. See, they've just hailed Jesus as a miracle maker, as a coming king. They can't conceive of his death or imagine his betrayal and humiliation. If this was the Messiah, if this was their saviour, then surely he would free them from the Romans, ascend the throne of David, bring in a new and glorious kingdom. They could see no glory in death, especially death on a cross. But Jesus points to a seed. I imagine that maybe he picked one up. We don't know that, of course. And he reminds them that in order for there to be a harvest, there must first be the death of a single seed, which as it dies brings new life and fruit. And this, my friends, is the wonder of the cross, that even though it represents humiliation, suffering and a degrading death, it also represents the most amazing act of sacrificial love known to humanity. The Apostle Paul picks this up in his letter to the Romans, where he writes this, Scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commendeth his love towards us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. <laughs> You know, there have been some amazing stories of gallantry and sacrifice in times of conflict. I was reading the other day about uh, the first Canadian to be ward awarded a posthumous VC in World War II. He was defending a, a building um, in Singapore against attack from Japanese forces. And as they closed in on his small company, uh, there were grenades coming in, and he threw a couple of them back. But then a grenade came in that, that he couldn't throw back. And so, in, without thinking almost, he threw himself bodily onto that grenade and was killed instantly. But in so doing, he saved the lives of his company. His body, you see, took the whole force of that explosion so that they could be saved. The Apostle Paul acknowledges such sacrificial love in humans, but he points to a much greater love. 
Because Jesus, the Son of God, sacrifices himself, not just for his friends, but for rebel sinners, for, as it were, the enemy, that they might be reconciled to God. The seed, Jesus says, must first fall to the ground and die so that new life can begin in your heart and mine. Thirdly and lastly, servants. Because with this message of sacrificial love for undeserving sinners like you and me, comes a call to sacrificial service. Do you see that, verses 25 and 26? Such love, you see, demands a response. And that response is to trust, follow and serve the Lord Jesus Christ, even to death itself. On a human level, I, ex I should imagine that if Sergeant Major Osborne had survived, his men would have followed him to the ends of the earth, wouldn't they? He would have had their trust, their loyalty and their love in every situation. And yet he was just a man, flawed, imperfect, fallible. But Jesus is God in human flesh, the perfect man, the one who was there at the dawn of time, but who became one of us, choosing to suffer death and all the consequences of sin so that we might be set free. And he calls us to follow him. If any man serve me, let him follow me. And where I am, there shall also my servant be. If any man serve me, him will my father honour. And Jesus makes it clear that such service might even mean giving up life here on earth to obtain eternal life. <laughs> How different is that from the message of our unbelieving world. As I drove up here, I was following a Land Rover. And you know, Land Rover promote their luxury cars and their off-road vehicles with the slogan, one life, live it. And if you believe that that's all there is to life, then why not? Why not make the most of it while, you, while it lasts? My friends, as we remember and honour the sacrifice of the fallen in two world wars and the conflicts that have followed, doesn't it raise questions in our minds? One of my colleagues lost his eldest son in Afghanistan. And what was that all for? Is it all ultimately meaningless and futile? Are we really just an impossibly freak accident are we just insignificant clusters of cells lost in the vast, pitiless cosmos, as these celebrity scientists on our TV screens tell us? And why is it that we are such strange moral creatures in such an amoral universe? I'm told that one of the most popular songs they sing at funerals these days is John Lennon's anthem. Imagine there's no heaven. It's easy if you try. No hell below us. Above us only sky. Imagine all the people living life in peace. Well, I don't think so. Maybe living without hope without meaning, without forgiveness, never knowing true peace of mind and soul that is to be found in trusting Jesus. Our passage ends, doesn't it, with Jesus pleading with the crowd to believe in the light and become children of light before darkness overtakes them. Verse 38. Jesus says, Walk while you have the light, lest darkness come upon you. For he that walks in darkness knows not where it goes. While you have light, believe in the light that you may be 
children of light. My friends, that's all that's asked of us, that we believe and trust in what the Lord Jesus Christ has already done for us as he identified with our suffering, carried our guilt, and conquered death itself so that we might live eternally. Won't you trust him? Won't you trust him and rejoice with me in so great a salvation? Amen. Well, what better hymn could we sing to finish than that wonderful Charles Wesley hymn, Depth of Mercy, Can There Be Mercy Still Reserved for Me? Can my God his wrath forbear me the chief of sinners spare? I was hoping you'd sing it to the new song, but I wasn't allowed to have the new song, the new tune. But we'll have a lovely tune, I'm sure. So let's stand and sing it with all our hearts. For of him and through him and to him are all things, to whom be glory forever. Amen.